of every superhero movie I've planned on reviewing on my channel, the Fantastic Four movies have been at the top of my list for a while now. The main reason is that I loved the Fantastic Four movies growing up, and the funniest thing about it is that I don't know why, I just remember loving these movies as a kid. A big reason I've always wanted to do this video is that I'm finally revisiting something important to me considering the Fantastic Four movies played a big role in my childhood. They're one of the many reasons why I've become the superhero nerd I am today along with the iconic Spider-Man Raimi trilogy which I plan on eventually reviewing on my channel as well. With that being said, we're only going to dive into Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. As for the infamous remake, maybe one day I'll force myself to rewatch that awful movie to truly give it the review that it deserves. In the words of Captain Amer, I mean the Human Torch, y'all know what time it is. Come on, come on, come on, flame on! Yeah, so I've come to a hard realization. Fantastic Four is not a good superhero movie. Watching the first Fantastic Four movie felt a lot like being excited to open up a time capsule you made in your childhood, only to be immediately disappointed by what was left in it, which then makes you question why you were excited by this idea to begin with. Nearly every aspect of this movie hasn't aged well, and it's because Fantastic Four is very very much a product of its time. A majority of the bits, jokes, highlight moments, or even set pieces are genuinely hard to watch because we progress so much with Marvel movies. And the thing is, this movie isn't as bad as other superhero movies such as Green Lantern or Catwoman which were both movies that were bad because the people behind those movies didn't know what they were doing or didn't have good ideas for those movies. The difference with Fantastic Four is that it feels like a piece of history that we all look back on with fond memories and our nostalgia lenses essentially cloud our vision so we don't see the hard truth about this movie. And you know what the weirdest part about Fantastic Four is? Fantastic Four feels both too short and too long at the same time. It's short enough to not feel like a complete waste of your time, but it's also short enough to make you feel like this movie needed a much longer runtime so the story and character arcs make a lot more sense. At the same time though, this movie also feels long enough to make you constantly check the time as you crawl to the end credits of Fantastic Four because you can't stand the early 2000s tropes within this movie. The core reason for these mixed feelings is primarily due to the story of Fantastic Four which is arguably my main problem with this movie. Fantastic Four's whole premise is that these four friends go on a space voyage, get powers, and then the movie primarily focuses on them learning about their abilities. From the 15 minute mark to around the last 10 or so minutes of this movie, Fantastic Four only focuses on this premise. The movie primarily focuses on Reed trying to learn more about everyone's powers and it never really strays away from that idea. And sure, I can understand that idea, but it's not done well at all. The catalyst of this movie happens in the first 15 minutes because it wants to already get to the point where everyone has powers. Besides getting to that moment, Fantastic Four only has one other primary focus, creating a sense of family, which I kind of understand. Like why not spend the majority of the movie with this cast of characters to make the viewer feel like they're a part of the Fantastic Four? By doing that you give funny, family-like moments and help grow the chemistry within this newly formed team. However, rather than feeling like a fleshed out movie, Fantastic Four feels more like the entirety of the first episode of a Netflix show that sets up the plot for the rest of a season. For instance, Fantastic Four spends so much time on this family element that this movie doesn't feel like it has an antagonist even though yes, Victor Von Doom is the antagonist of this movie and I'll get into that in a minute. It's just that this movie wants us to bond with this newly formed team but it also realizes that it also has to explain the powers in a 
way that makes sense to the viewer. So to remedy that concern, they quite literally make us watch these characters explore and discover their superhero powers, which then grows their chemistry or family bond, so to speak. For reference, there's a portion of this movie dedicated to Reed Richards explaining everybody's powers as if we can't easily register one person has stretchy powers, one person turns invisible, one person can light themselves on fire, and one person is, well, a thing. It's not invisibility per se. You should be able to bend light around other objects, even people. The core problem with this is that watching Reed Richards explore and explain the Fantastic Four's powers isn't fun because he overly explains it to us. Watching the Fantastic Four initially begin to explore their powers in the hospital is fun. It's cool to see Johnny realize he can snap his fingers and fire will appear. It's a little corny, but it's kind of cute that in an emotional discussion, Susan turns invisible. And despite the CGI looking atrocious, watching Reed use his powers to try and get to Ben is semi-cool. That alone is enough for the viewers to understand everybody's powers and can easily get us to a new story beat that moves the movie along. To give an example of a movie that does this same idea but better, Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man movie, which came out before Fantastic Four, explains Peter Parker's powers in a legitimately interesting way. Watching Peter climb up a building, figure out how to use his spiderweb abilities, or even swing across buildings is made for us to enjoy. Without any real words or an overly long explanation, we're able to understand who Spider-Man is and what Spider-Man can do ability-wise as a superhero. Instead, Fantastic Four takes this idea of needing to explore everybody's powers and stretches it, pun intended, across the entire movie. The idea of everybody struggling emotionally because of their new powers is the heart and core of this movie, but it takes up so much time that it leads to a very unsatisfying ending, which makes you question why you even bothered watching this movie to begin with. This, of course, leads me to my second problem with this movie, Victor Von Doom's story arc. This iteration of Doctor Doom is just pathetic, honestly. I don't even hate this Doctor Doom, but he's such a lackluster villain or antagonist that he might be one of the worst villains in a superhero movie I've reviewed thus far. Don't worry, Tommy Lee Jones iteration of Two-Face and Batman Forever is easily at the top of that list. Victor barely gets explored as a character at all. The movie starts with him talking to Reed about a deal for their space voyage. This, of course, brings back Susan's feelings for Reed as she sees him talk to Victor. Then everybody goes on said space voyage. Victor proposes to Susan out of jealousy, thinking that Susan may still have feelings for Reed. She never answers their proposal, and he gets mad. Everybody then gets powers, and then I think that his powers emphasize his emotions? I don't know, but I like to think so. After all that happens, Victor then just spends the rest of the movie brewing in the dark as he sits and waits for the right moment to emotionally manipulate someone into Fantastic Four so he can break them apart and finally get revenge on Reed for... Hold on, let me check my notes here. Being Susan's ex-boyfriend, I think. Oh, and I wrote this down too. Victor also gets a cut after getting powers and it drives him crazy because he thinks it makes him look weak or something. I don't know why that was so important for this movie to point out, but they did and I felt the need to share it considering it pretty much drives Victor mad. I promise you, this movie doesn't spend that much time exploring Victor's character arc because it's so focused on spending time with four other main characters. What this movie does emphasize regarding Victor though is giving nearly every shot of Victor a moment where he's brooding in the dark. I 
legitimately wish I was joking about this, but this movie quite literally has several moments where it cuts away from the Fantastic Four to Victor as he's just sitting there in the dark doing nothing. And you might be wondering why. Well, let me tell you, it's because this movie wants to make sure that you know that a person with the last name Von Doom is the villain of this movie as much as possible without actually exploring his character or giving him any depth. As if it wasn't obvious from that last name, let alone the first shot of Reed meeting Victor in this movie, which is him sitting in the dark talking to Reed, this movie wants you to know that Victor Von Doom is the villain of this movie. The saddest part is that the lack of exploration for Victor Von Doom isn't the worst part about his character, it's the ending for Victor in this movie. Like the beginning of the Fantastic Four, the ending of this movie feels incredibly rushed. In the last 15 minutes, Victor manipulates Ben, which leads to Ben losing his powers. Victor then uses this opportunity to kidnap Reed, which then leads to Ben reverting to his powers, and the Fantastic Four realizing that they need to work together to save Reed. The Fantastic Four save Reed, and then there's a literal 5 minute fight. Yes, I counted the exact minutes for those curious. Then Victor is frozen and put into a cargo container for the next Fantastic Four movie, Fantastic Four Rises a Silver Surfer. And all of this happens even though Victor doesn't do anything at all in this movie outside of the first like 20 minutes or so. Simply put, this movie wastes Victor Von Doom as a villain and he pretty much sucks in this Fantastic Four movie. And while we're discussing lackluster character arcs, can we discuss the fact that Ben is given a whole seemingly random mini love plot in this movie? Ben turns into the thing after their space voyage and his first reaction or train of thought is Hold on, let me check my notes here. Let me go find my girlfriend in the middle of the night in NYC, dressed up in a trench coat like a teenage mutant ninja turtle in disguise to show her what I look like now. As if that won't understandably terrify her. Then to make matters worse, when Ben's girlfriend comes outside to see him, she comes outside in the middle of the night in a nightgown. She doesn't decide to put Put on a jacket, maybe a hoodie. Nope, nothing. Like, why does no one in this movie act like a regular human being? If that wasn't bad enough, this movie eventually makes Ben find a new love interest in a bar, except she's blind. They use the fact that she's blind to emphasize how fucked up everyone else is for looking at Ben like he's a monster, despite the fact that he looks like a monster. Yes, I recognize Ben got the worst end of the stick when it came to the powers and his new life is hard, but don't try to sell me on the idea that that everyone else is in the wrong, that's a lie, you know it, I know it, even the people who made this movie know it, everyone in this movie that has been terrified after seeing Ben had every right to be terrified, I don't care what you say. On top of that, I don't even know why anyone would look at Ben, let alone the Fantastic Four in a positive light. They're not good superheroes. The Fantastic Four suck as a team. They're not good together. They barely know how to work as a team. They have terrible chemistry, and if anything, they do more harm than good. To give a few examples, Ben causes a massive car crash and traffic jam in New York City, which kills who knows how many people and destroys who knows how many cars. Johnny and Ben fight each other in front of a massive crowd of people that could have killed civilians. And on top of that, the Fantastic Four's fight with Victor causes a ton of damage. Cars are destroyed, a fire hydrant is wrecked by Ben, plus a bunch of fire and electricity is everywhere 
everywhere, almost killing people. Everywhere this team goes, they quite literally cause more harm than good. And yet for some reason, the civilians of New York City cheer them on and celebrate them like they're gods or good superheroes. I call bullshit. I'm sorry. I would absolutely know. I'm from New York. We'd be fucking pissed at this iteration of the Fantastic Four. The depiction of New Yorkers in this movie is an absolute lie. They're not good superheroes and they're barely fantastic in this movie. There's not a single moment where this team does something good that isn't immediately followed up or caused by a completely disastrous situation. If anything, they're the mediocre four as far as I'm concerned. Finally, this brings me to the last problem I have with this movie. I can't separate Chris Evans from Captain America after spending 10 years watching him growing in the role throughout the Infinity Saga. And because of this, watching him play Johnny Storm is rough. I can't stand Johnny Storm in this movie simply because of this at all. The whole he's arrogant, but he's funny, so you should like him angle doesn't work. His jokes aren't funny because nearly every joke comes at somebody else's expense. The whole brother sister dynamic between him and Susan isn't interesting because all they do is bicker despite being grown ass adults. Plus, that also gets barely explored in this movie, and honestly, he's only fun to watch when he's using his superpowers, which, once again, isn't until the very end of this movie. Whenever Johnny Storm is on screen, I can't help but think, Cap, man, what are you doing? And that might just be me, but I'm willing to make it known that watching Chris Evans in this movie now isn't a good time at all, primarily because I'm unable to separate him from Captain America. America. Jokes aside, the first Fantastic Four movie isn't good between the terrible CGI, the awful jokes that didn't age well, the lackluster story, the mediocre character dynamics, and the lack of an actual strong antagonist, Fantastic Four sucks. Sure, is it fun to watch if you turn your brain off? Yeah, absolutely. It's not bad like Green Lantern or Catwoman, which are both god-awful movies. It's just that Fantastic Four struggles to be better than being marginally better than the plethora of terrible superhero movies from the 2000s era. It's not saying much, but Fantastic Four is at least a competent movie that had somewhat decent ideas that needed better execution. With that being said, it's time to review the sequel to Fantastic Four, Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer is a terrible sequel and a bad superhero movie in general. Don't get me wrong, Fantastic Four isn't a good movie by any means, but at least it's watchable if you turn your brain off. Rise of the Silver Surfer, on the other hand, is just straight up bad. I'd even argue that this sequel is quite literally worse than Fantastic Four in every facet possible. The story is uninteresting, the subplots feel unnecessary, the writing is terrible, the characters regress, the Fantastic Four barely feel like a team, let alone a family, the antagonists aren't used well, and there's blatant obnoxious product placement across this movie. Hemi? Of course. Watching this movie wasn't a fun experience for me. In fact, I found myself often pausing or rewinding because I was trying to force myself to attempt to understand the logic of this movie. And before I go through the effort of criticizing the entirety of this movie, I figured it's only fair that I list out the positives in this movie. Well, uh... Their new suits are nice to say the least, and there's a cool scene where Silver Surfer is getting chased by the Human Torch. That was pretty sick, I guess. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's pretty much it. My biggest gripe with Rise of the Silver Surfer is this overemphasis on Reed and Sue's wedding. The core reason is that we don't really care about their relationship. Yes, it's a subplot in the first Fantastic Four movie, but we still don't spend enough time with the relationship for us to be emotionally invested or for it to be the core underlying subplot for an entire sequel. 
That's primarily because there's very little chemistry between Reed and Sue. There are more moments of Sue being annoyed at Reed or being emotionally upset because of Reed's choices, rather than seeing scenes where Sue is actually being happy with Reed. And yes, I know that not every relationship is easy, but when you're using a subplot such as Reed and Sue's wedding to build the overlying theme of a movie, you want us to buy into that subplot for positive reasons. In the case of Rise of the Silver Surfer, we don't buy into the relationship or wedding because we believe in the relationship. We buy into it because the movie wants us to buy into it. It's less, yeah, no, that makes total sense, and more on of, I mean, fine, I guess, sure, why not? This being an issue weakens the overall theme of Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, which is love. For reference, the first Fantastic Four movie is about the growing pains of a family as the overall theme with the side theme being love. This sequel switches those themes roles and makes love the overall theme with the growing pains of a family being the secondary theme. This movie spends so much time trying to get us to care about Reed and Sue's relationship, Ben and Alicia's relationship, Johnny not having a relationship, and Silver Surfer's struggle between saving the one he loves and his home planet by willingly destroying other planets. Along with those things, this movie briefly and weakly brings back Victor because he still hates Reed for supposedly stealing Sue away from him and getting engaged to her, which I guess brings me to my second problem with this sequel, its use of its antagonists. The Silver Surfer shouldn't be in this movie. He does pretty much nothing in this movie to warrant his subplot, let alone being the subtitle of the sequel. Silver Surfer shows up, makes a couple of big ass holes in the planet, gets chased by the Human Torch, gets captured by the US Army, and then decides to sacrifice himself so he can kill Galactus, who's a cloud by the way, because Sue reminds him of his loved one. That's it, he isn't an interesting antagonist at all, Silver Surfer barely speaks in this movie, he literally just stands there 90% of the time he's on screen, his only role in this movie is to connect with Susan to add an emphasis on the overall theme of love. He doesn't necessarily feel threatening because he barely does anything. Even with Silver Surfer leaving craters around the Earth, there's only one other group of people that care about these craters, and that's the US Army. And since this is the case, you don't really feel the pressure of the Fantastic Four having to save the day because nobody in the world seemingly cares. Like, Reed has a line in this movie where he's like, the world is counting on me, but no one in the world outside of the army mentions these random craters appearing on Earth. No one is freaking out and discussing how the world needs the Fantastic Four and how without the Fantastic Four, the world is doomed. So making it seem like the world is absolutely doomed or hopeless because of the Silver Surfer's quest to potentially destroy Earth doesn't feel as world threatening as it should. In an attempt to uplift these lackluster stakes, the movie decides to throw in another subplot, the return of Victor Von Doom, and I'll just be straight up with everybody, this movie didn't need a half-assed Doctor Doom storyline at all. I know, the end credits of the first movie hint at it and leave people on the note of the story isn't finished just yet, but what they did in this sequel wasn't worth it. It's half-assed and honestly, it's lost logically flawed to begin with. Victor is saved by some random dude. The movie never really explains it, but this is the case. It just happens and we gotta accept it. Victor then attempts to fight the Silver Surfer, loses, and is touched by the Silver Surfer, which gives him his regular skin back. Then somehow off screen makes a deal with the US Army to work together to stop the Silver Surfer, which makes no fucking sense. If you're the US Army and you have all of these secret files or whatever, what would ever make you think, let's make the Fantastic Four team up with Victor Von Doom to save the world? 
The US Army General makes it known that he knows who the Fantastic Four are, which would then mean he'd be in the position to know that they fought Victor Von Doom previously due to secret files or whatever generic reason you choose to believe. He's in the army, trust me, he'd be in the position to have this sort of information. This would then mean that he'd know that Victor attempted to kill Reed, so what made this general ever think that this was a good idea from the get-go? Literally anybody else in the world would have known that this was a stupid ass idea that should have never happened. It means this subplot should have logically never happened to begin with. To make things even worse, there's like one fight between Doctor Doom and the Fantastic Four that concludes with him sinking in the ocean. That's it. They work together, he steals the surfboard, becomes more powerful, attacks the Fantastic Four, and sinks to the bottom of the ocean or something. That is Victor's arc in this terrible movie. And to make matters even worse, this movie doesn't even address his death or anything. We just see him fall into the ocean and the Fantastic Four never mention his death, never speak about defeating him, and it's just treated like it's nothing after going through so much with Victor. Sure, the world is ending or whatever, but they could have at least mentioned that they were relieved to no longer deal with Victor. All it took was a few lines of dialogue to make this half-assed Doctor Doom storyline semi-worthwhile. Finally, this brings me to the last problem with Rise of the Silver Surfer, the regression of Johnny Storm and Ben Grimm. I don't understand what this movie was doing with either of these characters. In Fantastic Four, Ben is this emotional character who's struggling to cope with his new look as the thing. He even has a whole subplot about finding love and acceptance in this new world as the thing. In this sequel, he's this random comedic relief character who's suddenly a fan of taking photos with people? How do we go from seeking acceptance and love along with struggling with his new identity to being an entirely different person? There's no real exploration of this at all. It makes no fucking sense. It's like they changed Ben's entire identity without truly going through the effort of showing us why he is the way he is now. Sure, he has his relationship with Alicia, but even that's not a good enough reason for this massive change. And even though I understand changing the thing to appeal to kids so they can sell merch is the likely reason, you can still do that while explaining why you're doing that in this movie. There could be a subplot showcasing Ben's newfound love for life at the very beginning of the movie and this movie could have done the same thing for every other member of the Fantastic Four before starting the movie off with Reed and Sue panicking about their stupid wedding. Meanwhile, Johnny Storm goes from being the arrogant yet funny comedic relief character to the overcompensating for his jealousy character throughout the entire movie because he's envious that everyone else found love. The saddest part about that is that it is an interesting idea, but the execution is terrible and essentially barely explained. Like, that could have been such a cool idea to explore. Watching Johnny struggle with his loneliness and struggle with people looking at him differently due to his confrontation with the Silver Surfer would have made sense. It would have given him character growth and would have sort of humanized him a bit more and would have given us the ability to see past his ridiculous arrogance. Instead, we get basically nothing and his regression sucks. Oh, and Johnny becomes a total sellout, which leads to him literally doing product placement throughout this movie, which is both insufferable and makes total sense for him somehow. The point is, just like in Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer prioritizes ideas that are given too much time leading to quite literally everything else in this movie suffering for it. Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer sucks. It's not fun to watch. It didn't age well. And it's not even in the it's so bad that it's good category like Catwoman. There's just nothing here to really like. And there's nothing here that could make me say, yeah, 
but when voicing my criticisms or disdain for this boring movie. I guess this brings me to my overall thoughts about these two Fantastic Four movies. Yeah, they didn't age well at all. I'm sorry, someone had to say it. Fantastic Four is bad, but it's not bad enough to feel insulting or like a waste of your time. You can watch it if you're able to turn your brain off and be like, you know what? I just want to re-experience my childhood again. Rise of the Silver Surfer though, yeah, no, don't watch it at all, don't revisit it, it's not worth it, I promise you. In fact, I'd argue that these movies are better off living in your head as a fun, positive, nostalgic memory that makes you think, no, they can't be that bad as you watch this video. Unfortunately, I have to accept the reality that these movies aren't good and that they're not worth ever revisiting again. And truthfully, it sucks because these movies meant so much to me as a kid but you know what it is what it is right i guess this leaves me with one thing left to say no pick it's clobbering time